Let's just go for it. Let's go. Let's get this out. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's colloquium. I'm Rhonda Fritz, and I have the honor of uh, introducing today's speaker. This is Dr. Jared Jolin, and he is um, a colleague in the College of Education, and um, he's also my next door neighbor in the hall, and so we kind of know all of each other's secrets because of our paper thin walls, but you know, it's, it's a good, good thing. <laughs> um, so here's some more about Jared. Um, he runs Eastern Oregon University's special education program, One Man Band, and he does a great job. He's also um, a visiting researcher at the B Berkeley Evaluation Assessment Research Center of UC Berkeley. He earned his PhD in 2018 from the joint doctoral program in special education at the UC Berkeley and San Francisco State University. His doctoral research applied innovative approaches to educational measurement and assessment in the context of, a, of developing an assessment of soft skill proficiency for transition age high school students in special education. In the Graduate School of Education at UCB, his research and coursework in the quantitative methods and evaluation program encompassed methodological applications. In addition to studies into the conceptual and philosophical foundations of the practice of measurement in education. In the Department of Special Education at San Francisco State University, his work focused on understanding the nature of social cognitive challenges associated with ASD and the different ways to address difficulties experienced by this population across a variety of educational and community-based settings. Finally, he has held various professional roles supporting and teaching individuals with uh, mid, mild to moderate disabilities in K-12 settings, community college, and in the context of employment. And when he's not at work, he enjoys reading and spending time outdoors with his wife, wife Robin, and his daughter, Monty. Please welcome Jared Jolin. Well, thank you, Rhonda, for taking so much time out of your busy schedule to research me and develop that bio. You did an act. Everything's spot on. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today, um, investigation of item property effects on polytomous items using the many-facet Roche model. I have a slide to clarify a lot of those terms. It's been brought to my attention that many of those uh, terms uh, are unfamiliar to people. Um, but this, this is uh, one study of my dissertation, and it was one of the validity studies that I conducted uh, in that project. It's also one half of a paper that's currently being shopped around for publication. Um, you can see here our efforts. Journal of Educational Measurement, denied. <laughs> educational and Psychological Measurement, denied. So now we've moved on to Applied Measurement in Education. You always want to start high, and then you just work yourself <laughs> down. And eventually, someone will take it. So this is just one uh, data set that is used to demonstrate the application of this model uh, in that paper. OK, outline. We'll clarify some of the terms in that title. I'll give you a brief problem statement to try to contextualize why I think it's important to develop an assessment like this. Uh, then I'll talk about the development of this assessment. It's called the Social Evaluative Reasoning in the Workplace Assessment, Sir W. You can't have a good assessment if you don't have a good acronym, <laughs> Sir W. And I'm going to be specifically talking about the use of uh, the BEAR assessment system, BAS, which is a assessment framework, uh, des assessment design framework. Within the BAS, the BEAR assessment system, I'm going to be talking about this approach, the cognitive design system approach to designing items. And items are just test questions. I'll talk about how item properties which are derived from using this CDSA, uh, are related to the topic of construct validity, which in the field of educational measurement is very important if you want to you know, make a convincing argument that your assessment is actually measuring what it is that you intended it to measure. Oh, whoa. Procedure results 
And then I'll try to put all of this into real world terms. Well, what can we do with this kind of analysis and how can we um, uh, apply it in the real world? Okay, an item property. An item is just a test question. A property can be many different things. It can be any feature. One example of an item property can be the format. You can have an open-ended question or you could have a multiple choice question. That would be a format property. Let's say you're designing a test on biogeochemical processes involved in carbon cycling that transform carbon in socio-ecological systems. Well, the different processes involved in, uh, in, this, in this system can be features of an item, right? I, I can have items that are about cellular respiration, photosynthesis, transforming or organic carbon. I can even cross these things. I can have multiple choice questions about cellular respiration, open-ended questions about cellular respiration. So the concept of an item property is very open-ended. Polytomous item. This is just the opposite of a dichotomous item or a binary item. Think in terms of the traditional multiple choice question. One correct option, three incorrect options. That's what we consider a dichotomous item. A polytomous item uh, is a question that has two or more ordered score categories. So now we're talking about partial credit. A Rosh model is a family of latent variable models developed by George Rosh. You see him here. He's a Danish mathematician. Um, that create measurements out of categorical data. And I've introduced another very confusing term, a latent variable. A latent variable is just an ability or an attitude or a skill. It's latent in the sense that we can't see it. We can't measure it in the same way that we would measure the length of a board, right? We can see a board, we can put a tape measure to it. Uh, when we're dealing with latent variables, math ability, spelling ability, in my case, the ability to evaluate the outcomes of workplace scenarios. We're dealing with stuff that's happening up here. So we only get at proficiency indirectly. And the better that we design our tests and the better that we use theory to inform the development of the questions that make up those tests, the more convincing the argument can be that we've succeeded toward that end. And so how George Rosh fits in is his work was introduced at the University of Chicago by a gentleman uh, named Benjamin Wright. And he was like the person who brought to you know, the, the United States stage the application of these Roche models in the context of educational assessment. My PhD advisor, Mark Wilson at UC Berkeley, was one of George Roche's advisees. So I can say that I have a direct lineage to George Roche. <laughs> And then a facet. So a facet, an item property is an example of a facet, but facets can be other things. They can be any factor that a researcher thinks might contribute to uh, a person achieving some score on a test question. A very common application of this model is to deal with rater severity. So when you have multiple individuals grading, for example, essays using a rubric, some people, some writers might be more severe than others. Some might be more lenient than others. This model was really developed to deal with that, but it's since been extended and utilized to deal with item properties. Okay, problem statement. Oh. Ideal. So people with disabilities, and this has always been the case, it's still the case, uh, experience challenges in the workplace that often lead to negative employment outcomes. They get fired or they're underemployed. Many of these have to do with difficulties in the social domain, right? So when you look at the research on employment outcomes and the types of challenges that people with disabilities experience in the workplace, you see these types of things coming up. And this research is looking at people with autism, people with specific learning disabilities, people with ADHD. So things like social information processing, identifying complex emotions in other people, difficulty reading facial expressions, right? These are like very fundamental abilities if we want to be successful in negotiating social dynamics in any setting, but particularly in the workplace because the workplace has its own kind of unique set of restrictions on behavior, right? We can't respond to a flippant customer 
in the way that we would always, that we, that we might want to, right? In the same way that we might respond to a flippant individual uh, just out in the community. So researchers in special education are aware of this, and so you know, there's a lot of work in the field of special education uh, toward the end of developing uh, predictors of post-school success, so success after high school. And one of these predictors are soft skills instruction and soft skill development. Sorry, and assessments of soft skill development. Soft skills uh, are basically the interpersonal uh, demands of the workplace. We, we, um, we can uh, differentiate soft skills from hard skills. Hard skills are like the actual job duties. So if I worked at Kohl's department store in the shoe department, one of my hard, you know, a hard skill would be like my ability to like make sure all the boxes are just in line, right, lined up perfectly. All the shoelaces are tucked inside the shoes. Whereas a soft skill would be my ability to like deal with my annoying coworker and customers who just like uh, appear to have been born yesterday. Notwithstanding this, you know, this this uh, recognition of the importance of soft skill assessment. There's literally no research that has like went into developing assessments, right? Soft skills encompasses a broad range uh, of skills: problem solving, critical thinking, social skills, social cognitive ability, teamwork. Um, there aren't a lot of assessments that are specifically looking at some of these kind of social requirements, social skills as they relate to the workplace, or that are that are you know important for success in the workplace. So that was my goal with this. Uh, well, this project was to try to start addressing that gap in the literature. So let's go ahead and talk about this process. The, Burke, the Bear Assessment System. This is actually a, um, Bear stands for Berkeley Evaluation and Assessment Research Center. So it's like a, you know, it's a kind of second order. Um, I'm drawing a blank. But anyway, let's not go there. Here's the book, Constructing Measures, written by Mark Wilson. It identifies a four-stage test development process, okay? The first stage is to de uh, define a construct. The construct is what it is you're trying to measure, right? Maybe it's the ability to solve multiplication problems. It could be the ability to understand biogeochemical processes and carbon cycles. Uh, it, could be, it, could be, it could be anything. Generally, a construct is unidimensional. It's measuring one thing. Importantly, a construct should be research informed. We should look at the kind of research that has happened kind of in the field that we're wanting to assess to see, you know, kind of what people have kind of proposed in terms of like, you know, what does development look like uh, from no proficiency on up to full proficiency. The items design process, after we have defined a construct and created a construct map, we'll see an example of one later. You, you start developing test questions, items. We call them items in the field. Right? And these items are designed specifically to map on to your construct. Very important. The outcome space, well, this is when we start thinking about what might different answers look like to my test questions at the different levels of my construct. Right? So it's essentially a scoring rubric. And it's always easy to come up with an outcome space before you have any data. You give your assessment to a bunch of students, and they really just start fouling things up, because they give you answers that you just no way could have predicted. And, you know, and so kind of it's, this conversation with the data will, you know, it kind of, it can result in uh, you know, alterations to construct maps and outcome spaces. And then we fit a measurement model. There are many different types of measurement models. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into the details, because they've got like very complex equations, and to be completely honest, I don't fully understand the equations. I know when to use one versus the other, um, but we're going to look at a visual representation of the two measurement models that I used in this study. And this is an iterative process. I'm going to walk you through one iteration. What needs to happen next is I need to go through another, another iteration, and I'll talk about some of the things that I learned after going through my, my first iteration of these four building blocks. And again, uh, constructing measures. Um, written by Mark Wilson. Uh, this is like the introductory textbook to this process. So what is Sir W? 
Workplace-specific critical thinking that involves the appraisal of the appropriateness of employee behavior as it occurs in response to social cues that one may encounter in entry-level service sector employment. So a lot of my previous professional experience was supporting people with disabilities in entry-level employment. Very basic like customer service type jobs. Working at AMC movie theater. Uh, working uh, at um, Kohl's. My, my, my example of working in the shoe department was actually based in reality. So I experienced firsthandedly the issues that come up when somebody fails to kind of respond appropriately to social cues. And so I, here's what I proposed. This social evaluative reasoning, I think it requires two things. So it's a social cognitive ability that, that first draws on social cue detection. The ability to identify and understand salient pieces of social information. Oh, uh, Beth is back there. She's looking kind of bored, so I need to like really kind of spice up my behavior to get her kind of <laughs> back on track. Right? So identifying the cues and then using them to inform your own behavior. In addition, this ability to evaluate correctly whether or not an employee did the right thing in response to a customer's social cues. Because I wasn't able to put people into workplaces and, you know, hire confederates or, you know, pay research or you know my friends to go up to these subjects and like do weird social things and see how these people responded. I had to model this on paper. And I'll talk about how I did that. So I proposed two different constructs. And what we're going to talk about today is how the different types of social cues that I embedded in these workplace scenarios impacted the difficulty of being able to correctly evaluate the outcome of these workplace scenarios. And again, I have many examples of the comic strips. And so at the items design stage is when the CDSA, uh, the cognitive design system approach, comes into play. So this is really getting at um, providing a means by which to achieve construct representation. Think about, let's, let's do a little hypothetical thought experiment. You want to design a comprehensive assessment of, math, of arithmetic ability, the ability to add, okay? You would not be achieving a very high degree of construct representation if on your assessment you only had single-digit single addition problems, right? Because addition is much more than just single digit. You would have to have double digit, triple digit, quadruple digit, right? And that would be based on your research. So construct representation is just uh, ensuring that you, know, you are kind of fairly and comprehensively um, sampling kind of the, the domain in what you're trying to assess. And so what we do is we look at research in cognitive psychology. And so the item properties that we hypothesize to influence the difficulty of different processes are manipulated. So I'm going to walk you through some of the research that I did, the, the review, the literature that I looked at, to try to get a kind of you know, uh, direction to take in terms of what kinds of, kind of social cues or social information might make my comic strips more and less complex, socially speaking. And so using the CDSA uh, in the context of this BAS uh, framework, uh, one of the strengths is that it allows you to test hypotheses. Normally when we think about hypothesis testing in science, we think about you know, um, the hard sciences, physicists, chemists, chemists excuse me, conducting experiments in the laboratory, right? or psychologists conducting experiments in the laboratory, social psychologists or experimental psychologists. right? You have a null hypothesis, and your goal is to reject that null hypothesis. Well, this approach allows us to propose and test hypotheses, but in the context of assessment, which is very fascinating, and which is uh, not a very commonplace approach when you look at assessment research, especially in the field of special education. <clears throat> and so the mathematical models that we fit to our data basically provide the vehicle for the confirmation or the falsification of these hypotheses. OK. So being that I studied autism, and being that many people with autism experience challenges in the social domain, 
I directed my efforts, my research, into looking at the types of social cues, the types of social challenges that people with autism experience. And so there are a number of studies that, 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 um, that suggest you know, what those types of challenges are. A very seminal study is called the Reading the Mind and the Ice Test. And this test uses stimuli like this. And basically, people are asked to identify what emotion is that person experiencing based on her or his eyes. Bonus points if anyone can tell me whose eyes those are. Yes. Tanya gets bonus points. <laughs> I was just Googling this, and I was like, those are Nick Cage's eyes. And so uh, Simon Baron Cohen, who interestingly, if you're famili familiar with Borat or Ali G, Sasha Baron Cohen, they're cousins. So in this family, you have a very famous autism researcher and a very famous actor. He gave this test, the Reading the Mind and the Ice test, to groups of people with autism and groups of people without autism. And he had some very interesting findings. There's no difference in the ability to identify what are referred to as the basic emotions. These are referred to as the universal emotions. People from all cultures understand and can recognize these emotions. A gentleman by the name of Paul Ekman uh, is kind of the, he, was, he is the person who first kind of did this cross-cultural research and developed this idea. And so the six universal emotions are here. Anger, happiness, surprise, disgust, sadness, fear. What the, sample, what the, uh, the segment of uh, the sample with autism really struggled with were complex emotions, right? So complex emotions are, uh, require more integration to understand. You can't really identify a complex emotion just by looking at someone's face. You need to understand that emotional expression within the larger social context. And let me show you what I, me what I mean by that. So one of my factors, one of my properties, was Q content. So I made, I built, uh, you know, different types of basic and complex emotions into my uh, comic strips. Okay, so here's a guy. No context whatsoever, just a guy standing there. How does he feel? Someone. Huh? Annoyed or, yeah? Good. Maybe angry. So you're all good. You're identifying complex emotions without any context. So you're kind of ruining my talk. I wanted you to say angry. <laughs> right. So it, we, I mean, we could say that, no, oh, that guy's angry. We don't know what's going on. But you know, certainly the, the kind of nonverbal behavior, his hands on his hips, uh, kind of give us a bit more information. But when we build more context in, it becomes easier to see that this guy is feeling annoyed or he's feeling impatient, right? In order to understand that he's feeling impatient, we have to take into consideration his facial expression, his body language, the context, he's standing in line at a grocery store, and what he's saying, right? So my hypothesis here is that identifying a complex emotion is, is much more challenging than simply identifying a basic emotion, just saying, oh, the guy was angry. When you say the guy was angry, you just look at his face. You don't, have to, you don't have to take into consideration any further information. So that's an example of a complex emotion. I was also interested in this uh, idea of social cue delivery. And so also in the field of autism, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that people with autism have difficulty understanding sarcasm, metaphor, irony, right? Language that uh, that cannot be understood kind of when you take it literally, right? When someone is being sarcastic, what they really mean is the exact opposite of what they're saying in their communication. And so uh, uh, this woman by the name of Francesca Happ, she's another uh, very famous autism researcher, developed this study using strange stories. Uh, so Anne's mother has spent a long time cooking Anne's favorite meal, fish and chips. So clearly she's British. But when she brings it in, Anne is watching TV, and she doesn't even look up or say thank you. Anne's mother is cross and says, well, that's very nice, isn't it? That's what I call politeness. Right? So the question is, is it true what Anne's mother says? And why does Anne's mother say this? 
And so she developed like 13 of these strange stories and gave them to people with autism and people without. And again, found significant differences in the ability to understand, um, in this case, sarcasm. She also did studies in which she used metaphor as well. So another property that I manipulated was the kind of language that was used to deliver a social cue. So you get a figurative language or literal language. So here's an example of you know, sarcasm. Uh, hey, is there something I can do for you, sir? Uh, absolutely not. I'm just standing here for the fun of it, right? Clearly, that's not what he means. And then this is an example of a scenario that is incorrectly resolved. Well, then, since you're having so much fun standing there, I'll leave you to it. It's time for my break anyway. <laughs> and then he says, look, could you please just go check on something and back for me? Sorry, lunchtime. I'll go get someone else. <laughs> so Q delivery, we have Q content, Q delivery. And next I varied whether or not the scenario was resolved correctly or incorrectly by the employee in it. There's no research suggesting one way or the other uh, which of these might be different, but it's just another property that I thought would be interesting to manipulate. And so here we see an example of an incorrect resolution and a correct resolution up top. So each scenario had uh, a twin. And they're all the same except for the final panel. Lastly, well, it's possible to really load these scenarios with social information. I don't just have, like, you know, I don't need to have just one instance of sarcasm or, you know, one instance of uh, impatience. Um, there's research that suggests that people with autism, again, can be extremely challenged to kind of behave or respond appropriately to social perception questions when the number, when the amount of social information increases. So in this study, uh, conducted in 1997, uh, seven second video vignettes were viewed by people with autism. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, it's an old study, so this should say intellectual disability and people without any disabilities at all. And so in this vignette, two children are sitting on chairs, child one is reading a book, and child two says angrily, I'm not going to let you read any books while putting his fist in, the child, in child one's face. Here are the social cues, so there are a number of them. And the question they were asked is, why does he or she feel that way, relating to the answer? And so you see that people with autism really are not picking up on any kind of the social nuances in their responses. If we look here, the overall percentage correct responding to social perception questions as the amount of social information e increases, people with autism do less well. We look at people with intellectual disability and people without disabilities, they actually start to do better when the social information increases. What's that? Oh yeah, no, that's, now it would be like a tablet, right? So, social Q, or sorry, Q content, basic versus complex emotions. Q delivery, literal versus figurative language. Outcome of the scenario, resolu outcome resolution, correct or incorrect, and also varying the degree of social information. These are the factors that I manipulated in developing my assessment. And so then what we do is we develop what is called a Q matrix. And this is what specifies the presence or absence of each of these different properties. So for example, I showed you the two checkout ones. So zeros means basically that it's turned on, or turned off, ones mean that it's turned on. So in, that, um, in one of those checkout uh, scenarios that we looked at, we see there was both a complex and a basic emotion. Uh, there was some literal information that was uh, you know, important for considering, and it was resolved correctly. And so ideally you, want to, you create this matrix to try to do a, a fair job of um, kind of sampling the range of combinations. I didn't do that good of a job at it, um, but that's okay. And so I always ask the same two questions after every single scenario. List all the social cues that were available to the employee, and then overall, did the employee do the right thing in this scenario? Please explain. This is actually a very challenging scenario to get right, because it, 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 it kind of draws on this subtle notion of a social, an unwritten social rule overriding a very black and white rule, right? So this guy, uh, 
Uh, a mom and a daughter are approaching his ticket stand. We see this no outside food or drink sign here. Um, mom gives him the ticket. He says, uh, thank you, that will be the first theater on the left. And also, no outside food or drinks are allowed. And mom says, but it's milk for my daughter. And he says, sorry, rules are rules. I'm afraid you'll have to dump it out. Right, so this is like a very kind of nuanced, it, it was very challenging. Most people thought that he did the right thing, but I would argue that he did the wrong thing. Because when you're dealing with a toddler who has a bottle of milk, um, we, don't, at, we don't make that toddler adhere to the same rules as we would a teenager coming in with a big slam of Mountain Dew that was clearly <laughs> bought at 7-Eleven. And so, using all that research, we develop what is referred to as a construct map. And this is essentially the outcome space, too. So we have two constructs. So this is the, the one for the social cues. So at level zero, the person is not able to identify any social cues, or they identify non-social cues, or they just say something generic, like, oh, the customer. Well, what, what about the customer? That doesn't tell me anything. At level one, um, maybe they're providing like a verbatim or just kind of feature description, what the guy was doing with his hands, the look on his face. OK, well, that's a little better than one of these like, generic responses, but it still doesn't tell me, well, what was the look on his face? What did it indicate? You know, what, what, what did those hands on his hips mean? Um, level two, identifying basic emotions. Level three, complex emotions. And level four, and those situations or comic strips in which they both appear, identifying both of them. Not all uh, scenarios had examples of both. <clears throat> And then we have the evaluative inference ability construct. And this is referring to question number two that we looked at. So at level zero, the person incorrectly evaluates the scenario outcome. He did, you know, what he did was right when clearly it was wrong. Um, or just says yes or no and doesn't elaborate. So I, I don't know why. Um, I can't do much with that response. At level one, the person correctly evaluates it but their justification is, uh, is basically information that is explicitly contained in the comic strip, right? Um, yeah, he did the right, no, he did not do the right thing because that person was using sarcasm and they didn't mean, you know, when you use sarcasm, like you're not really saying what you mean, right? So all that information is explicitly contained in the scenario. The higher level is if somebody brings in world knowledge or background knowledge, experiential knowledge. So if they say, uh, no, he didn't do the right thing because the person was being sarcastic and trying to make a joke. And when you, you, know, when you work in customer service, the customer is always right. You should never be mean to the customer. So that type of response uh, exemplifies somebody who's bringing in background knowledge, kind of more experience. And so we favored those types of responses the most. <clears throat> okay. So now we have some hypotheses to go off of. One, complex emotion cues should contribute more to the difficulty of correctly evaluating the scenarios than basic emotion cues or literal emotion cues, based on that, that autism research that we looked at. Figurative language cues should contribute more to the difficulty of correctly evaluating scenarios than basic emotion cues and literal language cues. Lastly, multiple social cues should contribute more to the difficulty of correctly evaluating scenarios than single social cues. So that's what I mean by developing hypotheses that we can then test in the context of an assessment. Oh, giving away all my good stuff. So then we f oh. OK, there there. So then we fit a measurement model. And so I fit two, the partial credit model and the many facet Roche model. The partial credit model is also a Roche model. It's an extension of the Roche model. The original Roche model was appropriate for dichotomous data, right or wrong. The partial credit model is for polytomous items. When you fit a partial credit model, you get something like this. And so what these are, uh, along the x-axis, we have uh, what is referred to as theta, uh, or ability. On the x-axis, wait, x-axis, y-axis. Y-axis is probability. So these are probabilistic functions. And what they do is they model the probability of being in any one of the scoring or any one score category. So looking at category zero, we see that there's a very high probability of being in score category zero at a very high
high negative estimate of ability. As we go toward the positive, the probability of being that lowest score category becomes less and less. We see that category one, um, there is a, you know, there, there is less probability of being in that category at a very negative um, ability, and it gradually increases as we move to the right, and so on and so forth. When we fit this model, we get three different parameters. We get what are called step parameters, and these are difficulty estimates uh, for being in, in this case, category one, category zero versus category one. So that's the first step. And the second step is going from category one to category two, and that's this one. And then we have an overall item difficulty. So you get basically three parameters. This model, these delta and beta parameters, it's re what is referred to as a saturated model. When you fit this model, it's taking into consideration every single possible source of complexity that might be playing into these scenarios, right? We're not specifying everything. We're saying, here's the data, fit it to this model, and tell me what's happening. With the many facets Roche model, what we do is we can decompose those overall difficulty parameters, right? So instead of every possible source of difficulty, the model only, con model only considers a predetermined set. Right? So when I fit this model, I told it to only consider the features within each of these scenarios uh, when modeling the difficulty of correctly evaluating the scenarios. So let's look at the procedure. Um, I gave it to 80 students with disabilities. You see the breakdown here. Unfortunately, it wasn't mandatory to disclose, and so I don't know what disability over half of my students had. But they all were in special education, so I have a pretty confident, uh, I'm pretty confident that they all did have one disability or another. Um, and then some demographic information. Uh, about half of them, at some point in their lives, had held jobs in customer service, for example. <clears throat> 21 females, 59 males, mean age of 18, and we have a very broad age. You see, initially I only wanted to do transition age, which is like 16, or 14 to 21. But when you get into the realities of trying to collect data, you take whatever you can get, especially when you're trying to get out of a PhD program. 30-year-olds, <laughs> fine, let's do it. So I developed three forms, OK? And I used a linking structure. It's referred to the common item non-equivalent populations design. So basically, I have 16 unique scenarios. But I didn't want to give each student 16 scenarios. That's too much work for them to do. But I did want to calibrate all 16 of these scenarios. So what you do is you create a linking form, which are these form C forms. And so you'll see that the linking form has four scenarios from form A and four scenarios from form B. And so what this allows you to do is to put all of these uh, parameters on the same scale. It allows you to calibrate more items uh, and, and demanding less from research subjects. And so you'll see here, this is data missing by design. And we're going to look at the structure of the data here next. Oh, man. I've got to get a new pointer. So here's the data structure. So you'll see, look at these big red rectangles. You see those reflected in the data. So there's one rectangle, and there's the other rectangle. So we have form A, form B, and the linking form C. This is all demographic information. What grade are you in? What age are you? How many jobs have you had, et cetera, et cetera. Here are the responses. So this is the actual data that we're looking at here. And you'll see here that all these periods are the, the data missing by design. The, these people just didn't see those items. And you'll see here this overlap coming up to here, form A to form C, and then form C to form B. And so this was, allows us to put it all together. <clears throat> These very long string of digits in the back, which are the same on every line, well, this is where we're basically telling the model to only consider those properties that I've been talking about, for example. And so there are three different properties, Q content, Q delivery, and uh, outcome. So basically, there are 16 triplets. Each triplet is associated with the specific features present in that item. 
So for example, item number 16, um, 312. 3 refers to the fact that there are both a basic and complex emotion in that item. 1 indicates that there was an important piece of literal language in that item. And 2 refers to the fact that it was incorrectly resolved. And then what we do is, in, in the command, in the language, uh, in, in the, uh, the software that we use, we'll, we, we tell it exactly how to relate these things. So you'll see that 3 here refers to emotion in, in column 81. 1 here refers to the language in column 82. And then 2 here refers to the resolution in column 83. And these are all associated with responses in column 35. So this is how we set this up to run these analyses. I just really like all those numbers. It reminds me of the matrix. So I wanted to find some way to work that into my presentation. <clears throat> OK, let's look at the results. And it, using this co software, it's called Conquest. It's, it's a kind of software that's not very user friendly. It's like you, you do something wrong and you get an error message that just tells you nothing about what you should probably fix. And it's like really hard to figure out what to do. Um, but we don't need to get into that. OK, so as I mentioned, we're fitting different models here. We have the, the partial credit model, which is the saturated model. That's the one that considers every possible source of difficulty that might impact the success of evaluating the outcomes of those scenarios correctly. We fit an additive MFRM, the many facets Roche model. And so this is only considering the three different properties but on their own. So Q content, Q delivery. Uh, outcome. And then we fit an interaction MFRM where we start crossing those properties. So for example, here we have interactions between emotion and resolution and between language and resolution properties. I wasn't able to fit all the interactions because I didn't have enough scenarios uh, to represent all the possible interactions. So it causes the model to crash, the, the software to crash. The model won't converge. <clears throat> When we're fitting data models, uh, we need to compare them against one another. And so first we look at deviance right here. The deviance for the saturated model is always going to be lower, right? So when we're fitting models, the lower the deviance, the better the model did. The saturated model will always be better because there are more parameters being calculated to account for the variance in the data. When we start reducing the parameters, we tend to see deviance increasing. And we see that here. So we should never expect in this type of analysis to fit a many facets Roche model and have it, the deviance be lower than the partial credit model. But we look at these other indicators of model fit. Um, this was called Akaik's information criterion and Bayesian information criterion. And so these are just basically different indicators of model fit that use the deviance and that basically uh, in, uh, they, they, they impose restrictions for the more parameters of the model. And so what we see here, the additive MFRM relative to the interaction MFRM, the interaction MFRM in the AIC and BIC categories, these values are higher. So this is evidence that this additive MFRM did better than the interaction MFRM. And the most surprising finding is that we see the BIC value here in the additive MFRM is actually lower than that in the partial credit model. So what this suggests is that this theory that I use to design these items and you know, my hypotheses for like, you know, how I captured the social complexity actually worked out pretty well. And then what we do is we, uh, we plot the step difficulties. You'll remember the step difficulties in that graph that I showed you. They're the points where the two, the, the graphs, or the, 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 the ogives, the functions intersect. So for each function, or for each model, we graph uh, the step difficulties of the additive MFRM and the interaction against those in the partial credit. Now, if we had done a perfect job of accounting for you know, all the sources of difficulty, all of these triangles would be on that 45 degree line. But that's literally impossible to do. We do see that um, uh, comparing these two, um, the, um, the correlations are very comparable about 0.74 and 0.76, which, are, which is a decent correlation uh, in the social sciences. So taking into consideration what we saw here, so certainly this additive MFRM model 
fit the data better than the interaction MFRM. Um, it's expected that the PCM is going to fit better on, 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 in terms of some uh, indices. And relatively no difference here in you know, the, the equivalence of the estimated parameters. <clears throat> what we do is we choose the best fitting model. And then, we, and then we continue with our analyses. And so what I chose, so based off this evidence, it's the additive MFRM that is fitting the data better. Uh, fit better than the interaction MFRM uh, on both AIC and BIC, and it fit better than the PCM on BIC. So we can make an argument uh, that um, that model fit better. And so then what we do is we uh, compute an R-squared statistic. And so the R-squared statistic basically tells us how much of the variance in the dependent variable is accounted for by variance in the independent variable. And we see here that the R-squared is 0.34. So 34%. Not a whole lot, but an OK amount. In the social sciences, in the hard sciences, you know, that would be a very low uh, estimate. Because you know, in the hard sciences, we're, be able, we're supposed to be able to predict the behavior of protons and electrons, et cetera, with much more certainty. And so now we look at the different contributions by the different properties. And again, these are contributions to the difficulty of achieving full credit on judging the outcomes of the scenarios. So we had two statistically significant um, estimates, basic and both. So scenarios in which a basic emotion was present were on average 0.3 logits. And logit is like the, the log of the odds. Um, and I'm not going to get into the logit. But basically, 0 0.305 uh, units harder, and uh, those with both complex and basic emotions made uh, evaluating the outcome of scenarios at the highest level uh, 0.203 units harder. None, none of these other uh, estimates are statistically significant. And we see some interesting findings here. You know, one of my hypotheses was that figurative language would make present, the, the presence of figurative language in a scenario would make it harder to correctly um, um, judge the outcome of that scenario. But that didn't happen. It actually made it easier. So there's some, uh, some wonky things going on here. OK. We're going to even have some time for questions. So how can we, these results be put to practice? Well, we can, have, uh, we can put these results to practice uh, in, in, in an effort to um, you know, uh, fix the assessment, make the assessment a bit better. Right, so the greater difficulty of the basic main effect relative to the figurative main effect, right? That, goes, that flies in the face of my hypothesis. I hypothesize that the figurative language would, would make judging the outcome of the scenarios harder than a basic emotion. But that's not what happened. Well, let's look at what happened here. What I realized is that in every scenario in which like, a basic emotion was like a, you know, a focal kind of social cue, there was also an instance of figurative language uh, in the same scenario. So these are the scenarios in which, um, well, at least these two, in which a basic emotion was an important piece of social information. And maybe what's happening is that that basic emotion is being overshadowed kind of by the obviousness of the figurative language, right? In both of these scenarios, the figurative language occurs in the very first panel, right? Well, in this one, the figurative language isn't appearing in concert with the basic emotion of anger. Um, so it could be that, well, it was just very obvious. My sample did not experience any challenges identifying figurative language, right? All my research was in the field of autism. I don't really know. You know, there's 58% of the sample had an undisclosed disability. So maybe there just weren't a lot of people with autism. And so figurative language is actually something that was not a challenge to pick up on. And also some of these uh, you know, instances, like this one, for example, uh, the only focal cue is an instance of figure, figurative language. It's like pretty obvious that the person does the wrong thing. Welcome to our candy shop. Hi there. 
I guess you've got to have a sweet tooth to work in a place like this. <laughs> and the employee says, my teeth don't taste like anything, and I don't see how they are relevant. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> and it's pretty obvious um, that you know, this person kind of responded incorrectly to this, uh, you know, this woman's uh, attempt at humor. So it could be that the, the, figure the instances of figurative language just were like too obvious. They weren't, uh, they weren't nuanced enough. <clears throat> and here's something else that I realized after I did my analysis and submitted my dissertation, is that there were some appendices in that uh, reading the mind and the eyes test. And sarcasm, in their framework, was a complex emotion. I thought it would be important to kind of disentangle the two things, right? Figurative language is going to be its own thing, so we're going to code it as its own thing. It could make more sense to code all those instances of figurative language as complex emotions, so thereby eliminating two of those properties. Now I'm just dealing with basic emotion, complex emotions, or, or both being present. Um, so, you know, certainly this is something that I'll be going back uh, and fixing, kind of rewriting my, uh, my code to kind of recategorize and eliminate that language property because it doesn't seem to be appearing proper. It doesn't seem to be behaving properly. Also, I didn't have any scenarios in which there was just a basic emotion. The basic emotions were always occurring either with the complex emotions or with figurative language. I need to develop scenarios that just have basic emotions. That's it. So that's how we could use this information to improve an assessment. But let's say we had got it right. Here's the even cooler thing about these types of results. <clears throat> we have an equation here. We can call it a construct specification equation. You remember all of those estimates in that table that I showed of the main effects. Well, we can actually use those estimates to create scenarios at different targeted levels of difficulty. So for example, let's say I wanted to create the easiest possible scenario. Well, I would have uh, a scenario in which there are no emotional cues present, there's no language, and an incorrect resolution. So it's very easy to conceptualize that. We have a customer just standing there, uh, just looking at a product on a shelf, not saying anything, neutral expression on her or his face. And then we have an employee come in and just berate that individual, you know, make them cry. Well, they can't cry because there can't be an emotion, right? Yeah, that seems like a very easy kind of situation to, to, to evaluate. Um, according to these findings, the hardest possible scenario would be one that had, you know, a basic emotion uh, in concert with literal language that was resolved correctly by the, um, the employee. Of course, that flies completely in the face of my hypothesis, that one. Um, but I think, uh, you know, applying what I learned, uh, certainly with respect to not favoring kind of like the, the, the figurative language as being something different than a complex emotion, because in both instances, you, it, it does require kind of a more nuanced understanding of what the person's saying kind of in the context that they're in. So just one real world application. And that's all that I had. Um, so thank you all. And it looks like we even have like six minutes for questions, which is generally not the case when I give a presentation. You have one, Wilson. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> so what questions do you have? Could I do two quick questions? Oh, yeah. Um, one, am I right to assume that like using comics has been determined to be representative of like what would, you know, what would, <clears throat> you'd get the same results if you had actual people in real situations? No. Okay. I'm, not try, I'm not trying to make the claim that like comics are, you know, <laughs> capturing the, you know, the complexities of reality. Like I think it would be, it could be harder if I had videos, short videos, vignettes, right? Okay. Um, but as a starving PhD student, like right. this was a, an easy way. It was better than writing out the scenarios. Like an earlier version of this study, I had written, so I would say, oh, the, the customer, you know, uh, had the corners of his mouth turned, like describing an emotional right. expression, right? Okay. So this was the, the best way that I could think of um, to, yeah. you know, kind of approach the complexities of reality. 
And I think, uh, could you go back to that mo mathematical model with the three curves? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm just wondering why uh, it would help me to understand it if I knew why, there you go. Like, zero is downward sloping, <clears throat> two is upward sloping, but one goes up and then down. Right, so basically, How's best to describe this? So the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. category zero is the lowest, category one is the middle, category two is obviously the hardest category to achieve. So the reason that we see it going up is just by virtue of the probability of being in that middle category. So it kind of splits the difference between the two. And this is like an idealized version just for demonstrative oh, purposes. I see it. Okay, I get it. So, it, it. so if you look at the probabilities here. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. I know I get it now, yeah. Is, is category one like the sum of zero and two? No. No? Oh. Category zero would be <laughs> the person incorrectly resolved the scenario, or they just said yes. Even though, the, even though it was resolved correctly, they didn't give me any kind of explanation. Yeah. Category one would be just using information to justify their evaluation that is explicitly in. They're like not drawing into their justification any real world knowledge. Whereas category three is, a, is, a, um, is an evaluation that is kind of bringing the, these like higher level principles of like what does it mean to be like a good customer service delivery employee, for example. So the categories are the level of the blueprint. Exactly. And, the, and where they cross are, like the, are, are called the thresholds. Oh yeah, and you can see here. I had some notes. I forgot to put it on presenter view. So I was like, read my notes. Oh, they're not there. We have time for one more. Um, very interesting. I <clears throat> appreciated the, all of the, the detail that you shared with us. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is, so you went after your assessment, so changing your assessment, but you did cite that your sample had 41, 42% um, known in terms of their disclosed disability, but 58% right. were unknown. 58% unknown, correct. So do you think that, that perhaps it was it, it could have been due to sampling, that maybe your assessment actually was? Yeah, we can't rule that out because when we're doing this type of analysis, I mean, 80 is kind of a low number. Mm -hmm. Ideally, we would want a couple hundred um, right. just to achieve stability and like the, the parameters and the estimates, or the parameters that are estimated. So yeah, it very well could be sampling as well. And then but by changing um, you know, how I categorize things, I can fit the model again and I can see. Like I, it's very possible, very possibly the case that I could you know, account for more of the variance. Um, I could see some more statistically significant effects you know, if, I, if I did some of the things that I talked about doing. And but and yeah, but we can't rule out the sampling. You're exactly, that's a good point. And, and doing it at a, <clears throat> at a position of not sacrificing what the literature tells you, right? So not putting a, a basic emotion ahead of a complex emotion or the combination of a basic and a complex ahead, even though your data shows you that that's where you're going. Right, right. Ideally, I wouldn't want to do that. But it, you know, it, it doesn't hurt just to explore, you know? Right, but so, you talked about actually taking some of your figurative language and moving it over into the emotion state, right? Like a complex emotion. Right. Right. So, so that wouldn't, I don't think that that would necessarily call into the integrity of what the literature says. Right, because there's nothing in the literature that says like a complex emotion is more challenging than uh, an instance of figurative language. Right. So it could make sense just to combine them. So yeah, it wouldn't be flying in the face of what the literature suggests. And then I just have a, just a couple of questions also. So did you actually, so you said this is obviously idealized, right? It's just a, yeah. it's showing an example of an item characteristic curve. Right. Did, did your data tend to look like this? No. So did you actually get your most probable category for the ones that fell in your your middle categories. So I don't know, I've, I've done a little bit of item response work with polytomous models and, yeah. and getting those, those partial credit positions yeah, it's are very challenging. Hard. You know, and it, it, you do get some items that end up being nice and tidy, but oftentimes you get that being blasted out by your right and your wrong category. Right, right. And sometimes a, a further category is actually more probable than like a, well, a lower not, category. Yeah. But it can happen. You see it like can. disordering. Um, I guess then that leads to my question of, Going back to the way that you actually organize these, and you have you know four being the highest level, and mm -hmm. then zero being the lowest level, 
which implies that if you go from zero to one, that's the same step as going from one to two and two to three. I realize that that's how you have to model this, but have you given Well, no, you don't have to assume that the steps are the same. The partial credit model allows for the parametric structure of the item to vary. So like the steps don't, like a rating scale model is what you're talking about that yeah. assumes the same amount of, call it distance. Right. You know, it could be much harder to go from zero to one than it is from one to two using the partial credit model. Right. So I guess my question then is, did you see any evidence of those, those larger jumps then? Going so from one, to one to another? So one uh, source of output that we get uh, uh, the item analysis tables. And what we can see is the average theta estimates of the people who were scored into each category. So ideally, what you want to see is that at level zero, we see the lowest theta estimate. At level two, and then it increases kind of in step with your categories. And there were certainly some items that violated that. Like, it was harder to be in level two than it was to be. Or the, the average theta in level two was greater than it was in level three. So I mean, it, it's not, it definitely isn't perfect. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with so many factors in such a small sample, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not possible always to uh, kind of achieve what, what, what I'm showing here just as a representation. Thank you, thank you Jared. And oh, thanks thank everyone you. for coming. I'm sure Jared will hang out for a few minutes if you have additional questions. Oh, you, oh, what is it? <laughs>